on January the 7th, 1855, the minister of New Park Street Chapel in Southward, England, he opened his morning sermon as follows. It has been said by someone that the proper study of mankind is man. I will not oppose the idea, but I believe it is equally true that the proper study of God's elect is God. The proper study of a Christian is the Godhead. The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his Father. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in a contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so vast that all of our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can compass and grapple with. In them we feel a kind of self-content and we go our way with the thought, Behold, I am wise. But when we come to this master's science, finding that our plumb line cannot sound its depth and that our eagle eye cannot see its height, we turn away with the thought that vain man would be wise, but he is like a wild ass's colt and with solemn exclamation, I am but of yesterday and know nothing. No subject of contemplation will tend more to humble the mind than thoughts of God. But while the subject humbles the mind, it also expands it. He who often thinks of God will have a larger mind than the man who simply plods around this narrow globe. The most excellent study for expanding the soul is the science of Christ and Him crucified and the knowledge of the Godhead in the glorious Trinity. Nothing will so enlarge the intellect, nothing so magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. And whilst humbling and expanding, this subject is eminently consolatory. Oh, there is in contemplating Christ a bomb for every womb. In musing on the Father, there is a quietus for every grief. And in the influence of the Holy Ghost, there is a bosom for every sore. Would you lose your sorrow? Would you drown your cares? Then go plunge yourself in the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in His immensity. And you shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed and invigorated. I know nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, so speak peace to the winds of trial as a devout musing upon the subject of the Godhead. And it is to that subject that I invite you, as he says, this morning. These words were spoken over a century ago by a 20-year-old preacher by the name of C.H. Spurgeon. And those words that were true then are true now. But the human dilemma is that man does not want to engage in the most excellent study for expanding the soul. Nor does he want to contemplate Christ and Him crucified and the knowledge of the Godhead in the glorious Trinity. See, man's desire is that he wished that the God of the Bible did not exist at all. And he would rather have the God of his own making. Erwin Lutzer, in his book, Ten Lies About God, he writes this, I believe in God is perhaps one of the most meaningless statements we can make today. The word God has become a canvas on which each is free to paint his own portrait of the divine. Like the boy scribbling at his desk, we can draw God according to whatever specifications we please. For some, he is psychic energy. For others, he is whatever is stronger than I am. Or an inner power to lead us to deeper consciousness. To say I believe in God might simply mean that we are seeing ourselves in a full-length mirror. Douglas McCullum, he adds, When the story gets told, whether in the partial light of historical perspective or in the perfect light of eternity, 
It may well be revealed that the worst sin of the church at the end of the 20th century has been a trivialization of God. We prefer the illusion of a safer deity. And so we have parred God down to more manageable proportions. How do you see God this evening? Do you see Him as a safer deity? Or do you see Him as a God of more manageable proportions? Well, before you answer that question in your mind, listen to how He is viewed throughout society. Some people see God in in several ways, and one of those ways is they see Him as an eager bellhop. He's always there when you need Him. He carries your baggage. He never argues with you because you're in charge. And His only responsibility is to make you happy. And when He gets... All he gets from you is basically a smile, a thank you, and if he's lucky, he gets a tip. Some don't see him just as an eager bellhop. Some see him as a stern school teacher whose destiny it seems is to ruin a year of your life. He's the ultimate record keeper who monitors all your activities. He gives all the hard tests just to see his students suffer. And he wants and he demands, but he seemingly never gives or encourages. Well, maybe not a eager bellhop or a stern, a stern school teacher. Some see him as an impersonal scientist. He's intellectual, but he's not emotional. He spends all his time locked away in his heavenly laboratory working on unknowable wonders. But some even see him as a clever magician who must always work through signs and miracles and wonders. And if there's no manifestation of power, they conclude that God is really not involved. You know what Jesus said about this? Matthew 16, 4. A wicked and a perverse generation seeks after a sign. Well, some see him as a heavenly grandfather whose presence is acknowledged, who's visited occasionally, who smiles and tells them that he loves them when they misbehave. And then finally, there are those that see him as a Mr. Fix-It. And to view God merely as a Mr. Fix-It just makes him worthless for anything else. He's great when you're in a fix, but unnecessary when everything is going well. See, to view God in this way is painting your own portrait of the divine as Erwin Lutzer says. And to do that is nothing short of idolatry. See, to view God in any way or any manner other than what is revealed in the Bible is idolatry. See, contrary to popular belief, idolatry is more than bowing down to a small figure or worshiping in a pagan temple. According to the Bible... Idolatry is thinking anything about God that isn't true or attempting to transform Him into something that He's not. That's idolatry. So for us to understand God, who He is and what He is like, we have to come to the only source that reveals that, the Bible. And yet again, many people don't want to come to the Bible. They want to try to figure that out on their own. And you can't even entertain, well, I think God is like, and then our definition be other than what the Bible gives. We must come to the Bible to understand God. And I use the term understand only to mean that such is only possible with the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Because the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. He can't understand them. He can't know them. 